All right, so I wanted to address a message that Elon Musk gave out on X uh, regarding the upcoming election because I thought it was maybe the most significant thing I've heard all year about what is going on in our elections and how that affects not just American culture, American uh, uh, governance, politics, uh, the populace, the demographics of our country, uh, but also how that ties into the biblical worldview, the church, our eschatology, all of those things. So this is kind of a very a kind of far-reaching uh, sort of uh, episode where we're going to talk about a lot of different things. But let me just, let's just look at this uh, message that Elon Musk sent out on X. Let me just read this for us. It says, very few Americans realize that if Trump is not elected, this will be the last election. Far from being a threat to democracy, he is the only way to save it. Let me explain. Even if one in 20 illegals become citizens per year, something that uh, the Democrats are expediting as fast as humanly possible, that would uh, be about 20 million new legal voters in four years. The voting margin in the swing states is often less than 20,000 votes. That means that if the Democratic, quote unquote, party succeeds, there will be no more swing states. He goes on. Moreover, the Biden-Harris administration has been flying asylum seekers who are fast-tracked to citizenship directly into swing states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, Arizona. It is a surefire way to win every election. America then becomes a one-party state and democracy is over. The only elections will be the Democratic Party primaries. This... Uh, already happened in California many years ago following the 1986 amnesty bill. The only thing holding California back from extreme socialism and suffocating government policies is that people can leave California and still remain in America. Once the whole country is controlled by one party, there will be no escape. Everywhere in America will be like the nightmare that is downtown San Francisco. Now, that is, uh, that is Elon Musk uh, talking about what is happening uh, in the country with illegal immigration and that, how that is going to affect uh, our way of life, our population, everything. Now, let me just say that um, there is no doubt about it. There, there, there seems to be no way around the truth that we are definitely at a tipping point in America. We are definitely at a crossroads. And where we go from here, from November, from this election, from this presidential election, is going to probably determine what direction this country goes in for a very long time. Um, It looks like irreversible damage can be done to the country by the next administration if it doesn't correct some of the crazy uh, ideas and legislation and governance and policies of the previous administration. Some say the damage is already done. It's already too late. Uh, Again, due to immigration, Republicans may never win another election. That is a massive claim, and that is an important uh, reality that not just Uh, American citizens, but in particular, the church has to consider, but many people haven't considered these implications, I think, from a certain perspective. Again, according to Elon Musk, this is a simple mathematical equation. Um, But what, what do we do as a church if America indeed descends into that kind of chaotic political future and things become increasingly liberal, increasingly um, tyrannical. And as Trump recently put it, he believes that we are heading into either a dark age, if Kamala wins, or we're going into a golden age, if he wins. Well, I'm not here to talk so much about the golden age, (laughs) uh, what that means, (laughs) okay, Uh, of Donald Trump winning the election, my concern is that this, uh, these statistics and these factors that Elon Musk has brought up may have already been done. 
In other words, the damage may have already been done. Uh, enough illegal votes have been sort of, uh, you know, been taken all over the country, have been sort of, uh, uh, you know, re- repopulated, if you would, or the demographics has been replaced enough to where the vote has been uh, significantly, permanently, and ir- irreversibly altered uh, for that to happen. Now, why do I bring this up? Not because I want to talk about politics, uh, although talking about politics on this issue is somewhat inescapable. I want to talk about the new apologetics. And if you've been on our playlist and if you've looked at the new apologetics, you see that I've done probably 10 hours of content where I talk about uh, very, very important things like AI, transhumanism, a posthumanist uh, philosophy. I talk about things like paganism in the area of both spirituality and sexuality and what is going on uh, in, our, uh, in our, our, our world that is looking to do things like eliminate the bi- binary, um, sort of redefine uh, domestic terms like mother, father, things like that, to obliterate from the consciousness of man the God-given institutions of family and such. And um, I've also talked about globalism. Now, I want to talk about the new apologetics here just for a moment. The new apologetics is something that I came up with as I saw. I want to show you what I saw. I saw that in reading um, globalist material, transhumanist material, uh, uh, material on AI and things of that nature, I saw that the church is greatly unprepared and even deficient in these areas, that they are by and large unwilling as of yet, if you think about all the big conferences that you might go to, whatever they are, guys, whatever, G3, uh, uh, you know, the Gospel Coalition, I'm going broad here, Gospel Coalition conferences, different conferences that are put on by different seminaries, perhaps, or churches, or or whatever, uh, the Shepherds Conference, John MacArthur, and all the other kinds of conferences that are out there um, consistently, even, uh, you know, um, Answers in Genesis. Um, I had proposed a conference idea to Ken Ham and to the folks at Answers in Genesis. It got some steam going, and then for whatever reason, Ken Ham and his people killed it. They said, well, it's just there's not enough people that care about this. There's not enough attention. No one knows what you're talking about, Emilio. This is all great stuff that you're talking about. It seems important, but I don't think the church is ready to to confront these issues. Well, here we are. Um, You know, 2025 is coming really quick, but more importantly, 2029 is coming. And for those that don't understand what 2029 is— um, I can tell you that an author like this, Yuval Noah Harari, in his new book, Nexus, which I am now reading, uh, I, have spent, uh, I have spent many, many months going through his trilogy, whether it's uh, uh, Sapiens, Homo Deus, uh, Lessons for the 21st Century, whatever it is, uh, I've immersed myself in these kind of uh, books, whether it's Mustafa Suleiman, whether it's Mogadot, whether it's, and of course, all going back to Ray Kurzweil and people like that, Eric Schmidt, uh, Damien Broderick, uh, so many different, Max Moore, Vita Natasha Moore, all of these, or Natasha Vita Moore, um, Max Moore's wife, these are authors that the typical Christian apologist has no idea. I have not met another Christian in my sort of sphere of influence of folks that I talked to over the years at at uh, places that you may recognize, conferences like the ones that I mentioned, that have any clue who those people are or why it matters. And that is where the new apologetics was born. Because, you know, um, I shared with a couple friends on their podcasts uh, where I stood on this issue, what I have found, what I'm calling for, uh, the kinds of things that I think we are deficient in. And I, w- I let, me give, let me give credit to, um, to Ray Comfort and the Living Waters crew uh, that had, um, you know, that had, in my opinion, the discernment 
to bring me in to talk about AI for four episodes. We did four episodes on their on their podcast. Now, those were very, very lighthearted episodes. They were not very deep, not very technical, nowhere near what I think needs to be done, but at least they covered it. And uh, they are to be highly commended for that. Uh, also here down the street in, up here in, in Texas, um, I also spoke at one of the largest churches in Texas, if not the country, Jack Graham's church in Prestonwood, which, listen, theologically, I, I'm probably worlds apart from where they are. However, I will tell you this, they are to be greatly commended because they had me come in and do an, an, a couple lectures on AI and um, probably, I don't know, 700 people showed up for that, for my my uh, my sessions, which were just incredible. Reach out to me if you want me to do a session at your church or something like that. You can go on regracemedia.com. But I saw this remarkable deficiency in the church today surrounding this issue. Now, let me, let me just reiterate, what does it consist of? It consists of these issues like transhumanism, um, paganism that we are seeing. I don't know if you understand, but you merely need to peruse YouTube for uh, the kind of paganism that I'm talking about, uh, a paganism of an Eastern kind, enter in Peter Jones, uh, oneism, twoism, the paganism that is steeped in Eastern mysticism, Hinduism, Buddhist thought, uh, new age thought that has been completely repackaged by integral thinking, Ken Wilbur, Gustav Goth, Thomas Berry, and many, many others who have unleashed in the last couple of decades a a, a sort of neo um, a neo new age spirituality that is all uh, sort of couched in the language of self help mental wellness and all of those kinds of things. Um, you can see this in Apple events where Apple is telling you of the great new apps that they have that you can engage in uh, sort of new age meditation and things like that. Yoga is everywhere, uh, all over the place, right? Um, and these Eastern mystical ways of looking at your your consciousness, your spirituality, and ultimately the worldview, which is, which is oneist. It is pantheistic. The universe, you, Everything is conjoined together, this integral thinking that much of this goes back, by the way, to uh, Carl Jung. So go back and uh, look, at an, look at an episode that I did on Carl Gustav Jung. Uh, also, Jordan Peterson buys into a lot of Jungian psychology. Alex Jones on Infowars buys into a lot of Jungian uh, concepts that he tries to uh, synchronize with biblical Christianity. So you can hear Alex Jones talking about the return of Christ and Jesus and 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 you know all of this, but then you can hear him using the language of Young's archetypes and sort of a, a collective consciousness and all of these kinds of things. And so paganism, transhumanism, paganism, and then the issue of globalism. And this is where really all of this fits in. Part of globalism, you have to understand this, part of globalism is that we are talking about immigration. Immigration has everything to do with globalism. Globalism, again, is an attempt to bring all of the governments all the nations of the world under one sort of hom hom uh, uh, homogenic or homogenal way of thinking. Everyone's thinking along the same lines. Uh, there is this sort of amalgamation of of govern governments, but they they ultimately are governed by the same basic principles economically, uh, ultimately uh, ethically, sociologically. Uh, all of these things, okay? And now, when we think about immigration, this is what Elon Musk is talking about, right? I'm gonna tie this in, and I hope you stick along or st stick around for this, this whole presentation that I'm gonna give because it's gonna tie in to the work that I've done in the past surrounding what I call the last gospel 
in Revelation chapter 14. We'll get to that in a moment. But let me just talk about why this warning that Elon Musk is giving us here, why it matters to the church. Um, I should have brought the book up here with me, but there's a little book that is written by uh, one of the founders of the Muslim Brotherhood. His name was Zaid Qutb. Um, and I have recommended this book on this channel before for serious students of apologetics, and especially those that want to really study Islam and jihad and things like that. I wouldn't recommend this just to the average Christian, but you can get it. Um, it's called Milestones, and in Arabic, you can translate that either milestones or signs along the path. Uh, that's the way it was translated by various publishers. Anyway, um, in this book, Zaid Qutb, who, again, one of the founding members of the Muslim Brotherhood, so this goes way back to the 40s, 50s, you know, and things like that. Uh, Zaid Qutb was inevitably uh, a jihadist. He was a professor of Islamic law. He eventually was imprisoned by the Egyptian government for attempting to assassinate the president and was ultimately hung for his crimes. Now, his book, however, which I have read numerous times, uh, his book, Milestones, is a remarkable book that you that everyone needs to understand in terms of what he teaches in Milestones. In Milestones, he claims that the method of jihad is to be patterned after Muhammad in three basic rudimentary steps. Number one, immigration. Number two, infiltration. And number three, domination. He says this comes directly from the Sunnah. This comes directly from the Quran. This comes from di directly from the Hadith material and the Tafsir, different commenta commentators on uh, uh, the life of Muhammad and the Quran. And when you think about milestones, you, you understand that this is exactly what is happening in the West. Now, there's an obvious Muslim application to this, Allah, the UK, Allah, uh, you know, just look around the, the, the European Union, uh, what they're going through in places like Ireland and Scotland and Germany, uh, just all over Europe, you're seeing what? You're seeing Islam completely take over. You don't believe it, don't understand it, aren't fully awake to it yet. Just recognize that for the last, oh, I don't know how many years now, the most popular name for a newborn baby in all of Europe is Muhammad. I mean, this is, this is how quickly it's come to. So, But that is part of this globalist principle. And everywhere where globalist principles of governance have taken root in society, typically nothing good comes from it, especially not spiritually. Now, one of the things that is synonymous with globalism is multiculturalism, multiculturalism. And scripture is kind of, you know, scripture talks about this, right? This idea that you would move a boundary and violate the sovereign, the sovereign, the sovereignty of other states and nations. Uh, the major influx of foreigners, where, which even going back to Israel, God warned the people that foreigners would come in and rule over them eventually if they did not uh, have a responsible view of how many foreigners they let into their country, okay? Um, Obadiah talks about the fact that, look, there's a time coming where, you know, a certain, uh, you know, a, a certain invasion on Israel um, would indict the people who stood aloof, who did nothing, sat back as strangers came in and took over your land. Now, I'm not a theonomist. I don't believe that we are sort of uh, the the new theocracy, a repristinated theocracy or something like that. Absolutely not. But I do believe that in common grace, okay, and in the equity nature of the law of God, there is principles that we can derive that are common sense principles, principles that are just rooted in wisdom that everybody should understand. Um, but what is happening through multiculturalism, of course, is that as you have an influx of foreigners the way that we're having is that you're going to have a clash of religious worldviews that that hardly ever result in a godly society. Now, let's be clear: who's coming across the border? It has now been documented, uh, you know, ad infinitum. It has been documented that it's not just Mexican illegals coming here; 
It is people, nationalities, nationals from all over the world. They're coming, not just from Latin America, but from Asia, from Africa, and from the Middle East. And so what this results in, what pluralism and the goal of pluralism is not just multiculturalism, but it is pluralism. And pluralism is not something the Christian church can approve of in any way, because pluralism results in religious pluralism. We certainly do not want religious pluralism. We don't believe in religious pluralism. Now, we'll respond to religious pluralism through evangelism. But just understand, my friends, through uh, globalism, you are inheriting multiculturalism, pluralism, which includes religious pluralism, that ultimately results in paganism, in paganism. And so if Elon Musk is correct that this is perhaps the last real election in America, if the demographics and if the, uh, if the, the mathematics that he uh, is looking at is true, and Kamala Harris becomes the president of the United States of America, these immigration policies will absolutely fundamentally change the character, the face, um, the culture, the identity of America fundamentally and probably irrevocably without some kind of civil unrest, civil war, dare I say. Dare I say. Um, there's something different about our moment in history, and I'm going to do a whole episode talking about this fork in the road. There is something distinct about our moment in history that cannot be compared for those of you that think, well, this is just another historical upheaval. This is just another moment in the history of the world. But the problem is, is that prior to a moment like this, if you go back a couple hundred years, two, three hundred years, um, there were places to go. There were, there were uncharted lands to discover. Uh, there was the Americas. We no longer have that. There is nowhere to go. There is no new land to colonize. Um, we, we have a global, I call it the global mirror. We have a mirror now where we see ourselves as we are. This is how the world is. This is where the world stands. There's nowhere to go. There's no new civilization. There is no breakaway civilization that's going to be uh, beginning anywhere soon, anywhere near you. And so we absolutely are going to be confronted with what is going on in the United States of America as irreducibly definitive for the rest of the world and for the rest of our lives going forward in the near and distant future. And so globalism is super, super important, and that enters in to this whole discussion of how do we as the church, as Christians, how do we uh, evangelize and how do we do missions today? And in the American context, well, what does that mean for us? Well, I would say it means one thing right off the bat. Number one, the nations are here. Listen, I live in North Texas, and in North Texas, we are watching the phenomenon of the all the suburbs in North Texas. I don't know if you understand this. All the suburbs in North Texas right now are being systematically replaced by Indian immigration, not Latin American, not Mexican immigration, Indian immigration is literally, fundamentally, systematically transforming North Texas. Um, uh, and, and if you don't believe me, come on down. I'll take you down the street, and you'll see neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood. I'll take you to Costco on a, week, uh, uh, on a, on a weekday, anywhere between you know 3 and 6 o'clock, and you will absolutely think you're in a different country. I mean, this is how fundamental it is. You got to understand, I grew up in Southern California. This is the conversation I had with uh, a politician here in the area who claims to be a Christian. His name is Matt Sheehan. I went to a, uh, a Republican rally that they had. It was Matt, it was Greg Abbott, 
And afterwards, I was taken up to talk to Matt by somebody that knew Red Grace Media, knew me, and wanted me to go and talk to Matt Sheehan in person. I did, and I addressed this issue right here, not of illegal immigration, but legal immigration. And the, 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 the conversation was remarkably disappointing. It was eye-opening in that these people, these Republican talking heads, these Republican representatives, these Republican um, uh, politicians do not care that America is legally, demographically being uh, fundamentally transformed before your very eyes. Now, I told you, I grew up in Southern California, and I remember growing up in Orange County, California, in a city called Westminster, California, right? It was Westminster, Fountain Valley, Huntington Beach, that whole area. And in Westminster, California, Midway City, California, man, this is taking me back, Garden Grove, California, we witnessed the fundamental transformation of that demographic, which was far and away a either uh, uh, white, Mexican, some black, some Asian, but in in the course of a, of a decade and a half or so, we witnessed entire city blocks completely replaced by Vietnamese immigration. So that now when you go there, um, the Vietnamese population has completely taken over those cities. It is a remarkable thing to have lived through and seen. I, I remember in high school that there were race riots that would break out. The Vietnamese gangs would riot against Mexicans and others. And uh, it, it, it was a culture clash. I mean, I lived through that. And that's what's going on here in North Texas, maybe not gangs, but but what's going on in North Texas with, with legal immigration fundamentally transforming the demographics of our country, of our cities. That is a huge thing. Now, I'm not here just to talk about immigration. I'm, I'm not here just to talk about demographics changing. I, I'm here to say that what Elon Musk is bringing up is absolutely a warning. It is important. It's somewhat frightening. But let me tell you, um, we are a nation, I think, that is under remarkable judgment remarkable judgment. And, you know, when you look at what we've done over the last half a century and in the decades that follow from there, I mean, if you want to talk about what God has in store for America, I mean, we pray for revival, we pray for grace, we pray for mercy, we pray for peace, we pray that God in his common grace even would give us common sense politicians that aren't trying to literally redefine the sexes and obliterate the genders and all of this. But you go ahead and obliterate marriage. You go ahead and export, number one export of pornographic material all over the world. You go ahead and murder tens of millions of unborn babies. You go ahead and erase God from the consciousness of the country for decades through evolution. You go ahead and wave the the, the rainbow flag in the air from the embassies. You go ahead and do this. And this is God's way of what is happening. This warning of Elon Musk, if this all comes to pass, I mean, this is God's way of saying, mess around and find out. You live like this, you're going to get judgment, right? You sow, you will reap. And I'm sorry, but I am remarkably disappointed in many of our prominent Christian, Calvinist, Reformed leaders I'm sorry, guys. I, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed that we're having conferences about Calvinism for the 15th time, that we're having another conference about the inspiration of Scripture, that we're having another conference about expository preaching. But we're not addressing these titanic issues that are happening right in front of our face. 
I, I, I will not be happy until these conferences take a, a lecture on AI, transhumanism, globalism, uh, technological singularity, and, and the like, take it out of you know, a breakout session in room 102 and bring it to the keynote message. Bring it to the very front. This is our uh, new apologetic challenge. I mean, one of the reasons I called it the new apologetics is because if you think the future of America is debating with Mormons on the corner of the street, if you think the future of America, Christianity in America and apologetics and evangelism in America is debating with Jehovah Witnesses, you know, the, the days of Walter Martin, it's not that those threats are going away, but what is coming, the impending threat of what's happening at the sociological level is massive, is absolutely massive. It's different. The name of the game has changed. Uh, it used to be that politics was something we just looked at, right, as, um, you know, yeah, that's what's going on over there. The difference is now that it's no longer just parties doing what parties do within party lines. It's now that they are, they are venturing into areas that are intersectional, areas that deal with more than just the budget, the economy, housing, employment. Now we're talking about worldviews. Now we're talking about multiculturalism, religious pluralism, and importing paganism at an alarming rate. It is, we can no longer, in a sense, separate the socio-political realm from the socio-spiritual realm. We have to address it comprehensively and organically. That doesn't mean we all run for office, but it does mean that we address these things at the worldview level and not think that because it's political, it's not something that we can address from the Christian worldview level. Absolutely not. And so, again, I'm sorry, but I think that in the church, we have we don't have thick enough skin, number one. Number two, it's difficult. You go to the typical church, and I'm not just talking about evangelicals. I'm talking about those churches that claim to be Calvinist, where a lot of people are simply incapable of truly adult conversation and digesting difficult, hard truth. You understand that churches across this country labor as hard as possible to hide things from their people, to, to, to enrich their experience by making it as painless as possible and not put on them the burden of thinking, the burden of thinking. But if we can't digest hard truth, if we become dull of hearing, if we become incapable of actually having a comprehensive, thorough, robust Christian worldview that can respond to issues like transhumanism and globalism, we, we're in a world of trouble. Now, I told you I would tie this into the last gospel, and I'm going to do that here. So this, these usually are shorter takes, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I'm going to go further than that and go... I'm going to go, I'm going to try not to go any further than 40 minutes or so. What is the last gospel? Well, I preached this message at the Ark Encounter a couple years ago, where I delivered a message that I entitled the last gospel based on the fact that in Revelation chapter 14, especially verses, verse six, but then the context of verse 12, it is the last time the word gospel is mentioned in scripture. And when you look at it, uh, not only is this an angelic message, message of angels, and I think that's symbolic. I think it's symbolic, not of an angel flying around in the atmosphere, yelling at people, this eternal gospel, as it is called there in the text. I don't think that's what's going on. But I do think what's going on is that those angels are representative of the message that is preached at the eschaton right before the return of Jesus Christ. And so this angelic message containing what he what, what John called the eternal gospel. In, in, in a sense, it's a remarkably unfamiliar gospel. 
It, it's not a gospel that um, that is recognizable uh, to a certain degree because if you think about it, it's it's a it's a gospel message that you know it's unfamiliar because you don't have these familiar words like grace or faith or the resurrection, or the cross. You don't have references to any of that. What is the content of the last gospel? It is the creator and the creation. Let me just read to you very quickly from Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel flying directly overhead with the eternal gospel to proclaim uh, to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, and tribe, and language, and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who what? Who made the heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Does that sound like the gospel that you would articulate to a person on the street corner if you were doing evangelism? No, I think the gospel... If I told you, preach the gospel to this person, I think you would say, okay, well, you know, uh, you you have sinned against God. Uh, You need forgiveness. Uh, Jesus Christ died on the cross. Uh, Repent of your sin. Put your faith in him, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But John is saying that this eschatological gospel has to do with God as creator in the moment of judgment. And why is it why why do I call it the last gospel? Because there's it's kind of a play on words. Not only is the gospel the last time the word gospel is mentioned in the Bible right here in this passage, but it's also the last gospel because it is an eschatological message. It is a message of a world that is so pagan, I believe, so disconnected from basic worldview frameworks that it literally needs, for lack of a better word, it needs a recalibration that can uh, that that can reorient eschatological man with the most basic, most rudimentary, fundamental truth, namely, God created everything. You are God's creature. You belong to the Creator. There's a Creator above and a creature below. There's a distinction between the creator and the creation. And the only way to have a proper relationship with the creator is through the gospel. It's through Christ. Now, he'll get to familiar territory when it comes to the gospel as he talks about the saints in verse 12, where he talks about endurance, perseverance, the uh, saints persevering as those that are obedient to God and have faith in Jesus Christ. But notice, in one sense, this last gospel, the last witness of the church to the world, is a witness of judgment. That's what I believe is going on here. Now, when I was originally doing the work on this, I obviously went to G.K. Beale in his commentary on the book of Revelation, which I think is the finest commentary ever written on the book of Revelation Uh, by Dr. Beale. I don't even think it's close. But uh, in Dr. Beale's commentary on the book of Revelation, I found remarkable support for what I was talking about. And in his commentary, I want to read you something that he said in his commentary, because I think it's remarkably, remarkably important. So let me just read to you what G.K. Beale says. He says, if the notion of a coerced fearing and glorifying and worshiping is ultimately not satisfactory, then the angel in chapter 14, verse 8, must be seen as issuing a final decree for genuine conversion, which directly, uh, which the direct, directly following context shows will go unheeded. It will go unheeded. The angel's words would then be an exhortation to unbelievers to turn from idolatrous worship of creation to that of the creator. God is identified as the creator of all things, verse verse 7, as a motivation for people to worship him instead of the creation. Now, this is what's so important, guys. Listen carefully. The verse is analogous to, To Acts 14 could be analogous to Acts 14, verse 15, where Paul says, we are preaching to you to turn from these vain idols to the living God. Now listen to the parallel to Revelation. 
who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, this is, this is a point we'll end right here. Acts 14, 18. Uh, G.K. Beale says that, this, that verse 18 notes, Acts 14, 18, notes also um, that the audience continued in their idolatrous attitude which also is the expectation in Revelation chapter 14. What is G.K. Beale saying? What G.K. Beale is basically saying is that our pagan world, as it comes to the end of the age, will be steeped in idolatry and paganism, and the last witness of the church will go remarkably unheeded and sadly like in Acts chapter 14. By and large, the idolatrous world system will continue in its idolatrous worship as they reject the true and living God. What we're witnessing in this election, I believe, is not just America, but the world at a tipping point. That is not to say God will not save a remarkable new humanity from every tribe, from every nation. That is not to say that God does not have his elect in all the four corners of the world. He does. He'll bring them out. But if you notice carefully, the distinction being made here, Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, we know who God redeems. It is people out of the nations, not the nations comprehensively. Why? Because here in Revelation 14, it is, not, uh, it is not a declaration uh, to those who dwell on earth from every nation. He doesn't do that again. Doesn't use the preposition ek from. But he simply says every nation, tribe, language, and people. And so the insinuation is that there is a universal warning as uh, G.K. Beale talks about here, this sort of final decree, a call to conversion, a universal call. It's not just to people from the nations, but it is a universal call to, uh, that is of a more universal kind to every nation, tribe, tongue, and language. And so what's the point? The point is this, is that what we see in Scripture is a result of man's idolatrous rebellion and rejection of God is not, I believe, not an end-time revival Christianization of the world. But the reality is, is that in the end, the gospel predominantly, in the very end, becomes a message that is used to judge the world and condemn the world for its idolatry, which, if Acts is a pattern in in a parallel to Revelation 14, that warning, that call, that, that gospel will go largely unheeded and rejected. And so therefore, we need to prepare ourselves as a church to be ministering uh, in increasingly pagan times and in a pagan context. If we don't, we're fooling ourselves about the kind of future that we're getting ready to go into. And so I thought I would connect Elon Musk's idea of... Th- these ma- this massive implication uh, of this upcoming election and how it connects to the last gospel. So I hope that you enjoyed that. Make sure, share this video, subscribe. Also check us out on Christ and Kingdom podcast. Thanks so much for listening.